Last week um, I presented the, the Perceptron uh, together with a, a nice and easy application of it. Uh, we did some uh, easy character recognition. Yeah? And now uh, today I present the nearest neighbor method uh, and when we, so when, uh, after presenting the method, I will uh, show results with the same example. Yeah? Okay, so nearest neighbor method. Yeah, this is last time I already talked about um, a comparison of nearest neighbor and the perceptron. And nearest neighbor, the nearest neighbor method is, um, is a lazy learning method. A lazy learning method where during the learning phase, we are lazy, so we don't do, actually we don't do anything apart from storing the raw data. That's all we do. Uh, we just store the data uh, and then when I want to classify an unknown uh, input, uh, then I have to do some work. Uh, I mean, this is like if, if we talk about humans, uh, Let's take the Lexmate example. Huh? And maybe a physician, a doctor, has seen many Lexmate, uh, many, many appendicitis patients. Um, and for all these patients, he has seen whether the patient was really sick or not. So whether the patient had the appendicitis or not. And maybe he memorizes all these samples in his brain and then now today there comes this new patient and then the doctor asks himself, oh let's, let's think, did I have such a patient with these symptoms already? And if yes, then the doctor would treat the new patient the same as the old one. That's the nearest neighbor method or kind of the nearest neighbor method. Huh? Okay, and I mean this works if the physician has a good sense for similarity. I mean he really has to do some research in his brain which one of the old patients was the most similar to this new patient. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and once this physician has found in his brain the most similar patient, then the next question is, is this old patient similar enough to the new patient such that I just can treat the new one in the same way as the old one? Huh? Maybe I found the, the closest patient, but it's not close enough, so I should not treat the new one in the same way. Okay, yeah, let's look at this picture. This makes it uh, really visible what's going on. We have uh, two dimensions, x1 and x2, and we have the positive class here and the negative class here. And now, for classifying some new point, we just look for the closest, for the nearest neighbor in all our training data and then we assign to the new um, data point the class of the nearest neighbor, which is here, negative. Huh? So this is really easy and implementation is also very easy. Um, what we need to know when we implement a method is a formula for computing the distance uh, between two points. Uh, we have two points, x and y. We are looking for a distance functions, function for two such points. And what we typically do is we just use the Euclidean distance. And this makes sense in many uh, applications, but not always. Sometimes we would use uh, other distance metrics. Uh, uh, we have already seen in the eight parcel example the Manhattan distance, which is quite useful in many cases. 
There, there are many other distance functions like the Mahalanobis distance or um, the, the Hemming distance which is if, if, we, if we talk about bit vectors then the Hemming distance is quite useful or sometimes we also need or want uh, a weighted distance huh? um, and that's what we have here so for all the components of my vectors x and y for, for each component I use a weight wi weighting each component. Uh, so if one of the components of my vector is much more important than the other components then I of course would have a higher weight for this one component. Uh, and also these weights may be used for scaling the values. If in Lexmate the leukocyte value may be uh, 20,000 uh, while the pain symptoms are just 0 and 1. So if we wouldn't do any uh, scaling or weighting then all the other uh, features would be irrelevant uh, compared to the uh, leukocyte value. Okay, yes. Uh, and, and these weights, so in the, in the simplest case these weights have to be uh, given manually. So some, the knowledge engineer has to know the weights. Okay. The algorithm is extremely easy. I don't know whether, yeah, maybe I'll just explain it. Yeah. So I'm looking in my sets M plus and M minus for the nearest neighbor to some new uh, input S. And what we do is we compute the distance between S and all x in these two sets m plus and m minus. Yeah? So we're looking for the minimum distance between all x, all points and our new point s and when we find this uh, this vector x um, then this, uh, I mean that's what we call t, this is then the point with minimum distance. That's T, yeah? and we use the argmin function. Do you know the, the difference between the minimum function and the argmin function? Who does not know? Okay, so maybe I should explain this. The argmin is something that's used very often in machine learning. Um, yeah, just take an example. Um, yeah. This is my function f of x and let's put some scale here. 2, 4, 6 2, 4. So now we're looking for the minimum of this function f. What is the minimum of f? There are a few minimums. Yeah, we, we found a couple of minimum minima. This one, this one, this one. Huh? and also this point here. Huh? But, okay, let me ask this question more precisely. Uh, which one is the absolute minimum? Huh? And the answer is simple, it's this one. Huh? But now, um, formally, if I ask uh, what is the minimum of this function, then if you give me the answer this, this is formally not correct. I want to have, I want to have a number, okay? So if you say 15.3, that might syntactically be a correct answer, but here it's of course not correct. 
Huh? So what is the minimum? I mean, it's, we were talking about this point. Okay? So now we have this coordinate is, let's say, 1.7 and this is 4. Huh? What is the minimum? What would be the correct answer? The minimum of f. 1.7, that's the point. Uh, not 4. And 4 is the arc min. I mean, if I would ask you, where is the minimum of f? Uh, for which input x do we get this minimum of f? Then you would answer 4. And this is what we call the arc min. The argument of the function f where we have the minimum. Okay, so that's arc min. And that's why we get one of the axes as the argument, which we call t then. <coughs> okay, and then if t is in m plus, then return plus, else return minus. I mean, this return value is then the class which we assign to our new input x, s. Okay, yeah. And now, in order to understand what uh, the nearest neighbor method does, it is very helpful to look at the so-called Voronoi dia diagram. Uh? The Voronoi diagram is what we have here. Uh? So we draw into in our space all the data points. And for the moment, we do not distinguish between any classes. We just put the data points there. And then we ask ourselves, um, let's start with this point. Um, what is the region of my space in which a new point would have this point as a nearest neighbor. And this region is, that's what you, what you get by, um, yeah, inside this area here. Huh? I mean, it's easy to understand how we get this. I mean, which are the points, if we look at these two points, these on the left side of this straight line are closer to this point and these are closer to that point. And now, so I can draw this line here. And this, this is, uh, so, um, initially this is infinitely long. And then we look at these two points and then we get this line. And, and here we get this line for these two points, and for these two we get this line, and so on. Yeah? I mean, we could do this with other points too. If we take these two, we get a line which would look like that. But this would be not effective because we already have this line which is closer to that point. Yeah? Okay, so um, now if we draw all these lines into the picture, what we get is the Voronoi diagram. And this Voronoi di diagram tells us which is the region around some point where all its, uh, yeah. this is the set of all points which have this data point as a nearest neighbor. Yeah. Okay, and now in this uh, figure here, we distinguish between the two different classes, the positive and the negative class. And now we can draw the, this black line separates the two classes. Yeah? So now we have the line dividing the two classes. And I mean, it's obvious that here we have a completely different situation 
to that of the perceptron. What is the big difference? Yeah, it must be a straight line. Huh? And here we have, as you said, it may be an arbitrary dividing line. Huh? So the nearest neighbor method is much more powerful than the perceptron. Huh? You c we, can, we can really represent arbitrary uh, dividing lines between the, the, the classes. Look, I mean, uh, yeah, we take an example. Let's take what is the, po the positive ones are the green ones. And now we take some negative points somewhere in between. Like that. And now, I mean, yeah, we, we may try to draw a Voronoi diagram. Uh, here this may be like that. So you see we have an isolated triangle for this class here. Huh? Um, and between these two we get this line and this line and uh, yeah, this. Something like that. And you see we have many separated areas for this is for the red class one area, this is one for the green class and oh yeah, okay, it continues here. Uh, yeah. So these areas, they don't need to be connected uh, and it may be uh, arbitrarily uh, complex. Okay, yeah. Uh, Yes, and if we look at this example here, then we see this is an example which shows a drawback of the nearest neighbor method because, I mean, here we have a big cluster of negative points and there are a cluster of positive points and maybe this is an, an outlier. Maybe that's a data point which is just due to noise but not, not uh, a real area of, of positive uh, points. And now this new data point would be classified, would it be put into the positive uh, class even though this is just noise. Yeah? So that's a disadvantage of the nearest neighbor method. And this effect that we have here, that's what we, uh, what we uh, call overfitting. So we fit something which is not really to, uh, there. We, and that's why we call it overfitting, because we do too much uh, fitting to some uh, artifacts of the data which are not real. And uh, I mean, we, yeah, we will now look at how we can solve this problem. Yeah, and the solution is K nearest neighbor. Yeah, maybe we just go back to the example. We can solve this problem if, we, if the decision we take, the class decision for the new point, is not only based on, one, uh, on the one nearest neighbor, but on, let's say, the three nearest neighbors, for example. If we take the three nearest neighbors, then yeah, maybe these two and this one will be the three nearest neighbors. And what we now do is we just take the majority of the three nearest neighbors and it would be these two. 
Um, and they are of both of the negative class, so the majority is negative class, and therefore we would classify this point as a negative data point. Um, I mean, now it might happen, the probability is extremely small, but it might happen that a second uh, uh, positive point would be somewhere here, and then we ha would have two, uh, two positive and two negative, and we would have a draw. So you see, it may be even better to take more than three nearest neighbors, maybe five or six or seven. Um, and then we would definitely have the negative class here. Yeah, so now uh, what happens in the extreme case of very many nearest neighbors? So we don't take three or four or five, we take as many nearest neighbors as we find. What would happen then here? What would happen with this point? Which class would it have if we take 50 nearest neighbors? I think it would be the red class because there are more red data points. Yeah, that's it. And it would be the red class for our data point here too. Huh? So in the extreme case, where we take as nearest neighbors all data points, then we would always have the same decision, which would be the majority of all data points. So we, we wouldn't look anymore at the particular um, values of my data vector. They, we would just <coughs> ignore the details we would always say it's the class of the majority. Okay, this is the algorithm. I think we don't need to look at this pseudocode. It's, it's very simple. And, it, and I mean, it's obvious everybody uh, understands it, I guess. Um, yeah. And now, if we do the nearest neighbor method on our um, pattern matching task here, pattern recognition task, with the, same, with the same example we used last time for the perceptron, then we get this result. So the, the, the black dots are the result now. So uh, on this axis we have the number of bits that we flip in one of our training patterns. So, I mean, this is more or less the distance uh, between our test pattern and um, one of the training patterns. And here we have the correctness, so this is 100%. And as you can see, um, for a number of bit flips up to eight, we have 100% correctness. So all, all our test patterns, even with uh, quite a bit of noise, I mean, we have uh, our patterns uh, consist of 25 bits, and up to eight flipped bits, which is quite a lot. I mean, this is about one-third of all the bits are flipped in the image, yeah? and that's, that's quite much. So even with one-third of all the bits flipped, uh, we have a perfect classification of the noisy patterns. And now if the number of bit flips is bigger, then it goes down but I already mentioned last time that 12.5 is, this is, um, yeah, this is the farthest we can go away from our original, from our original image. Because if we go farther, if we are here, what does that mean, 25 bit flips? This is 
the inverted image. Yeah? And the inverted image, of course, is strongly correlated with, with the original image. Yeah? So this is the, the uh, we can't go farther away from our image. So you see, um, the nearest neighbor method is much better than the perceptron. So the gray points, they are the perceptron. And you see here, this is much better. OK, and that's very important. Please remember that the nearest neighbor method, and especially uh, the k-nearest neighbor method, um, is among the best classification uh, algorithms we can use. Okay, yes, um, so, um, yeah. I mean, what I, yeah, maybe I should, I should also um, do this example with more than one nearest neighbor and look at the results. That would be nice to see. But I'll, I'll show you some results in a few minutes about the k-nearest neighbor method. Um, yes, and an, an extension of this method, it's, it's also applicable if we have more than two classes. So, um, yeah, let's look at an example. We may have the green class and the red class. And we may have a, a, a third class, the white class. And then the question is, how does the nearest neighbor method work? I mean, it's, it works in the same way. I look for the nearest neighbor, and then I return the class of this nearest neighbor, no matter how many classes we have. So that's really easy. Huh? Um, and if we use the k nearest neighbor method, we again do a majority decision. Huh? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, what's, what's important is for classification, I mean, that this is not only true for the nearest neighbor method, it's true for all classification methods. The classification methods, they are good if the number of classes is not too big. Yeah? Let's say below 10 different uh, classes. Um, if we have I mean, we might have 10,000 different classes, and in principle, we could apply uh, classification algorithms, but I mean, look at this, look at this picture. We have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 data points. If we have 14 data points, and uh, 50 different classes, that wouldn't make much sense. Yeah? Why? Because for 36 of our 50 classes, we would, we would have no data point at all. And how can we do machine learning without any training data? Or in other words, I mean, we'd, we need more than one point for each class because of statistical reasons. So in order to have good statistics, we need from all the classes many data points. Huh? So if we have 10,000 classes, uh, then um, in order to get 100 points for each class, we would need 1 million data points. I mean, if we have so many training data, it might be OK. Huh? But maybe we want to have even 1,000 data points for each class. So the number of data points you need um, increases with the number of classes you have. Okay, 
Yeah, let's look at this other example. This is a nice example. We are talking about such a little, very simple uh, little robot. The robot has a differential drive. That means uh, two wheels which, can, uh, which are powered individually. And so the steering of this uh, robot uh, works via the different uh, speed of the two wheels. Uh, we have already seen such simple agents when we talked about the Breitenberg example at the beginning of the semester. And there, in our agent, we had a very simple logic, which might be, uh, I mean, there are two sensors here, two light sensors, and uh, the speed of the left wheel is proportional to the uh, intensity coming from the left sensor and for the right wheel and sensor the same thing. Or we could, we could just cross the connections and then we would have a different behavior. But now we do machine learning. So now the logic inside here has to be learned. So we don't know what the logic is that we want. We just train this agent. Huh? And how does the training work? I mean, in robotics, we would call this learning from demonstration. Huh? Now, what we want, suppose, we want to train this agent um, in order to have an obstacle avoidance. Huh? And suppose this light source here is an obstacle. So now, then we would train the agent not to hit the object, but to just pass the object. In this case, it would pass it on the right and then move uh, further on. Or if the agent comes like that, we would make a left turn here. Huh? So we would really, we would actually, while we train the agent, I would take it manually and just move it uh, around the obstacle. Okay, and then as, as training data, the robot would ga get something like this as the point. In this diagram, on, on this axis, we have the ratio of the sensor inputs. So the ratio of these two inputs. Huh? Um, and this ratio is between zero and one. Let me see, what is it? Yeah, sensor input, the right divided by the left input. So this input divided by that one. So uh, this is bigger than one if, the, uh, if we get more light here. So that's in this area. Um, so the, if the obstacle is on the right side, we are in this area. And if the obstacle is on the left hand side, we are here. Huh? And now, if the obstacle is on the left-hand side, we, we would have to make a right turn. And on this axis, we have the difference of motor voltages, UR minus UL. Huh? So if this difference is bigger than one, uh, bigger than zero, yeah, greater than zero, then we make a right turn. Is that correct? Greater than zero, you are, no. Then we make a left turn, yeah. If it's less than zero, we make a right turn, yeah. And what you can see from our data points, this point, for example, tells us if the, uh, so this is, this is greater than one, so the light source is on the right side, then we would make a left turn. If the li light source is on the left side, we would make a right turn. And the particular way of these points shows us how much left turn or right turn I should make depending on these inputs. So then, so while I move this, this robot along, it would collect a number of data points. Huh? And now suppose uh, we, we, we do have only these five points here. Yeah. Now, if we do nearest neighbor classification, mm -hmm. 
then what we do what would we, would we do we would take a new sensor input like this guy here huh? and then we would look on this axis maybe I should draw it which one is the closest uh, data point so we would have this point this 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 and this and now if there is this new data point which is here then we would see this is our nearest neighbor and now we don't do a, a classification anymore we this is actually an approximation task because our output is not two classes the output is this uh, voltage difference so it's a continuous output but what we would do in the, in the simplest case is we would say okay this is our nearest neighbor so for the new data point let's use the same voltage we had here yeah? and that would mean you can see for all the points between here and actually here we would have the same constant voltage huh? and this line where we have this jump here is the middle between this point and this point so in this area we use the value of this point up to here which is the middle between these two points and so on okay so that's what we get as a result and I can tell you this robot would work with this output function but it wouldn't look very nice what wouldn't be nice with this robot the behavior would be kind of discontinuous huh? so it would if the robot moves it would move a straight line um, it would kind of have a straight line up to here and then it would make a discontinuous switch like that and here it would do it like that and here it like that so it wouldn't be a very smooth behavior huh? in order to get a smooth behavior we would need an approximation to our data points like that so we really want to have a smooth curve huh? but the naive application of the nearest neighbor method just using the same output value as the nearest neighbor uh, gives us something like that huh? yeah now yeah do you have an idea how you could how we could use a modified nearest neighbor method which gives us such an output uh, curve I mean look the problem was that we just take the value of the nearest neighbor even if we are almost in the middle between this point and this point we still use this value I mean couldn't we say suppose we are exactly in the middle and then we would take the average of this value and this value which would be somewhere here which would be much better than using either this or that value and now maybe uh, it's obvious if we are a little bit closer to this point so we t we take uh, this point with some weight and that point with a smaller weight so we get a value which is closer down here and if we are closer to this point we, we take this point with a higher weight yeah? and that's what we call the distance distance weighted uh, nearest neighbor approximation oops sorry yeah k nearest neighbor for approximation problems and that's that's the formula so um, a 
I mean for, for k equal 1 so we just take one nearest neighbor then this sum vanishes and we just take the function value of the nearest neighbor if we take two nearest neighbors in this formula we just sum the two values and divide it by two so we just take the average value huh? so let's go back here the, the two nearest neighbor method how would yeah so please think for a moment how would the result look like if we take two nearest neighbor and uh, do this uh, and use this function uh, use this formula here which is just the average of the two nearest neighbors now how would it look like would it be this would it be that would it be something different how would it look like as our output value we always use the average of the two nearest neighbors I mean let's let's start drawing the, the curve and I do it in the right uh, diagram so if we are in the middle between these two points, if we are here, we take the average of this neighbor and this neighbor. And the average is the value exactly in the middle between. So we would use this. Now, how about this point here? We also would take the average of the two nearest neighbors, which is this value and so we get again we get such a step function which is constant in between the two points and then we get this here and this here and this in, in this area so we would have a step function again just with different steps okay yeah that's what we would get now do you have an idea how we can uh, come to something which looks like that which is a smooth continuous function by using some modification of nearest neighbor or maybe you see the disadvantage of what we did what is the reason why we get these steps here we don't use the distance to the neighbors yes yes we do not use the distance even if we are very close to this point we still use this which is far away with the same weight so maybe you, we should use a distance weighted nearest neighbor method and that's what we get here so now look at this formula this formula is <coughs> quite similar to what we had before yeah let's look let's go back here we just take the sum over all and then divide it by k which is just the average of the values of all nearest neighbors we just take the average and now what we change is we introduce a weight 
we, we introduce a weight wi as a factor in this sum. And that's what we have here. Look. The sum of all i, wi, f of xi. That's the only, the only change we make. We introduce a weight here. And now here in the denominator, this is just a normalization constant. Look, what is that? This is the sum over all weights. Huh? So that's a, uh, that's a fixed constant which does not depend on our data point. Yeah. And now, of course, the interesting question is where do we get the weights from? We just said we want to have a weight which is the bigger the closer I am to a point. So the, the closer my neighbor is to the new data point, the higher uh, we want the weight to be. And that's the function, or that's, I mean, this is one possible choice for such a weighting function. You can, you can use something else. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe we should start with something simpler. So, how about Wi um, is equal to 1 over D of X comma Xi? Yeah. I mean, here we have this inverse property. The smaller the distance, the higher the weight. That's the easiest uh, thing we could do, maybe. But this has one severe disadvantage, this weighting function. Why is this not good? Yes, and may that happen, distance zero? Yes, it may. When? In which case do we have distance zero? When we get the point that is equal to the data point. Yes. When our new point is equal to one of our training data points, yeah? then the distance is zero and then it wouldn't be defined. Okay, so now let's say, um, suppose it would never happen that the new point hits one of the, the training data points. But what would happen if the new point is very close to a training data point? Then the weight would be extremely large. Huh? It weight would be extremely high it, it uh, goes to infinity for smaller distances. Huh? Um, and maybe we don't want to have such extremely high weights because then all the other points would have no influence anymore. And we can solve this problem by, by adding a one, for example, here. Huh? Because now the denominator uh, cannot be smaller than 1. No? And that's why we have this 1 here in the denominator. No? And then uh, we, I introduced such a constant alpha, um, yeah, which is important because, I mean, this distance here, these distances, they depend on the scale of my axis. Yeah? So suppose these values are all times 10 to the power minus 20. And if I would use this formula, then I would have uh, here in the denominator always 1. Yeah? So there wouldn't be any influence from the, from the distance. So we, would, we need some weighting factor depending on the scale of my data. OK, 
Okay, yeah, and why do I have a square here? Uh, I mean, this is not so easy to argue. Um, The square makes sense in two-dimensional data. Yeah, suppose this is my new data point and now I have a set of, of training data around them. And now let's draw a circle around uh, this point a circle with a fixed radius r. And now the idea is that if I take such a, a ribbon or with a, a certain width delta r, and now the idea is that if I take this radius, r, and I count, or I, I, I would like to know the expected number of data points in this ribbon, and I may take a ribbon of the same width very close to my data point. How many points do I see here? Of course, um, less than here because this ribbon is much longer. Huh? And now the idea is that the overall weight of all the points in, in here and the points in here uh, shall be the same. Huh? Yeah. And that's what I get if I take the square here. because the number of points on average I would get here increases quadratically with the distance from the origin because the area in this ribbon uh, here increases quadratically. Yeah, that's the point. Oh, is this true? No, that's not true. In two dimensions, it goes linearly. But in three dimensions, in three dimensions, then I would have a, a sphere. A sphere with a certain thickness, and then the number of points on this sphere increases quadratically. So for three dimensions, this formula fulfills the property that points in any distance from the origin uh, always have the same weight. Okay, yeah. But it, it's important to say that this formula, I mean, it's quite good, but this is just an arbitrary choice of the weighting uh, function. So you could use something different uh, if you think this is not appropriate. Okay, and now let's look at some results. Yeah. Oh, the lines are really extremely thin here on the beamer. Okay, so I used some one-dimensional data points. Um, and, yeah, so first on, on the upper half of the screen, you see the normal k-nearest neighbor method uh, with the, the, uh, the simple formula, with this simple uh, averaging formula. Huh? Yeah, and for k equal 1, that's what we get. 
look at this point for example then uh, all the nearest neighbors which are these points they get the same output value and then here and we have a jump in between for k equal 2 I mean this is what we have already seen in our little robot example so we have this value in between these two points and this value in between these two um, yeah and now if we increase k um, then still we have a step function it's not continuous but I mean if you look in at this area here you can see we get some kind of averaging yeah? so look here it we, we really go down to this point or we go up to this maybe this point is is just an outlier huh? so maybe uh, the real curve goes like that and this is an outlier so we get overfitting here we get overfitting so we really approximate the outlier but here in our curve you wouldn't see the outlier anymore but the disadvantage uh, which you immediately see is that um, we do have the discontinuities now here we use the nearest neighbor method with the distance weighting with uh, this function over there yeah we have an alpha too yeah and and you see now we use uh, we use different alphas here huh? um, so we have alpha equal 20 so this is the alpha yeah. um, yes and the higher our alpha is the more influence we get from the distance compared to the one here yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that's the result. And you, what you can see is that between two points, the curve really approaches the point and then goes away from it. Yeah? So we have some oscillations which do not look very natural. And now if we take a smaller alpha, then we get this curve here and for an even smaller alpha uh, we get this curve and this maybe does already too much averaging huh? yeah. so you see this alpha here is kind of a smoothing parameter yeah. But what you see is with the nearest neighbor method, uh, which is still extremely simple, uh, we can do quite good approximation, function approximation. Okay, yeah. I mean what's not very nice here is that we have these kind of oscillations between the, the points and yeah here we see we still see it a little bit this is due to the fact that hmm, yeah, uh, we let's look at the formula. We do this averaging and use these weights WI of our nearest neighbors. But each neighbor gives me depending on the distance a constant weight huh? so we, we just do an averaging we just take the average of the, the neighbor values 
and this simple averaging of the neighbor values leads to this result. Yeah, of course, I mean, this guy here has the highest weight and that's why it goes down here. Huh? And now obviously these two both um, these two together have less weight than the sum of all the others which are higher up and that's why it pulls the curve up here again. This effect can be avoided by improving the method. Um, I mean, yeah, there is an improvement of the distance weighted nearest neighbor, which I do not present here in the lecture, but maybe I just mention it. Um, it is locally weighted linear regression. We will talk about linear regression later in this lecture. We will also talk about linear regression in the math lecture. Um, and I mean, the idea behind linear regression is quite simple. I take some data points and uh, yeah, I'll put on here. Linear regression is just we fit a straight line through our data point. That's what linear regression is all about. Huh? And now the locally weighted linear regression is Suppose these are our data points and now we do linear regression. Um, suppose we want to classify a new point which is this one. Now what we do is to classify this new point we do a linear regression with weighting of the data points. So these two of course get the highest weight and all the others they get lower weight and finally the straight line we get would be something like that. And for a data point here we would do linear regression, weighted linear regression again. We would get this line and for this point we would get this line and so on. And now if we interpolate between all these lines, we get a, a very smooth curve which is similar to what we see over there but even better. Yeah. Um, yes, and um, yeah. I have to mention here, it's very important. I mean, here in this picture you see a curve. I mean, this is a function we approximate to our data points. But when we do, uh, near, we use the nearest neighbor method, we do not have this function. This function does not exist in, <coughs> does not exist in reality. It only virtually exists. Why? How does our nearest neighbor method work in terms of machine learning? It is lazy learning. During learning I just saw the data points. So I do not 
produce this function during the learning process. And I don't produce it either while I recognize a new point. It never exists. What happens when I do nearest neighbor method? Suppose we are here in alpha equal 4. We just store the points, that's it. And when there is this new data point for which I want to know the output, suppose it is here, and then I use my formula. I use my formula and I get this value as an output value. But I just get this one point. So that's very important to know. What did I do to produce these uh, curves here? I used the nearest neighbor method formula for, I don't know, maybe 100 or 200 points, and then I just plotted it. That's it. Is that clear? That's very important. This function does not exist in reality. And that's why this is a lazy method. Okay, yeah, and now when we, when we start talking about uh, uh, the running times of the algorithms, we really see the disadvantage of the nearest neighbor method. So learning is extremely simple because we do lazy learning. And therefore we have extremely fast learning. We just store the data points. But classification and approximation of a new vector x is very expensive. And how expensive is it? So there are, there are two, um, two components of the classification of our new point. First, I have to find the nearest neighbors. Huh? So I have to find the k nearest neighbors among our n training data. And in order to do this, I have to compute the distance between my new point and all the training data points. So this, the complexity goes linearly with the number of training data. So you see this, this can be very expensive if the number of training data is large. And normally in machine learning, we are happy when we have lots of training data. The more training data, the better, because then the statistics, statistics is better. But if, with the lazy learning methods, this is expensive. Linear complexity in the training data. But this is not all. Um, now, when we do k nearest neighbor, then we, we have to look at the k nearest neighbor and to average over the function values of the k nearest neighbors. So the classification or approximation has linear complexity in the number of neighbors that we consider. So the total computing time is linear in n plus k. And yeah, so we could actually, here in this formula, we could actually use k equal n. So we, we could use all the data points in this formula which would, be, would give us the best approximation. And then if k equal n, then we would, uh, would even have a quadratic complexity in the number of training data, which would be even worse. Yeah. So as a conclusion, um, the nearest neighbor method, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, let's do the conclusion first. As a conclusion, um, the nearest neighbor method is perfect. It's an excellent method if the computation time for the 
for classifying or approximating a new point doesn't matter. And there are many applications where it, I mean, it does matter all the time, but maybe it doesn't matter if it's one or two or five seconds. Yeah? Uh, if this is the case, then use a nearest neighbor method. Yeah? Um, yeah. If, if computation, uh, computational time really matters, so if you ha do have only nano or milliseconds or microseconds of time, then you should not use such a lazy learning method. And also, there is also an, another scenario where nearest neighbor ne methods are not well suited. Whenever you want to understand what your classifier, for example, in case of a classifier, what the classifier does or why the classifier does some decisions, I mean, here you, you just have some numeric uh, weights in your function and you take your data points. And now if somebody asks, but why would you now um, say this is the best matching uh, training pattern? I mean, the answer is that's the, the, uh, uh, that's the nearest neighbor and that's it. Huh? but you, you do not, not have an explicit description of what you have learned. Huh? So whenever you need a symbolic description of the knowledge you extracted from your training data, then this is completely useless, huh? the nearest neighbor method. Okay, yeah, let's, let's look uh, at this nice little example. Uh, that's an example that I, uh, I have from my uh, sabbatical in the year 2000. There I was at the uh, Swiss Avalanche uh, Forecasting Institute in Davos, where they, I mean, they do the avalanche uh, forecast every day. Uh, this is similar to a weather forecast, so the, the skiers or people who drive over the Alpine passes, then they know uh, whether there is uh, a, a danger uh, for being hit by an avalanche. And, and the avalanche hazard level, uh, it's, uh, it is between one and five. And five is extreme danger, and one is uh, almost no danger at all. Yeah? And now, what, what they do is they use a number of values, like uh, how much snow do we have, uh, the temperature, uh, then this variable, which is the three-day new snow sum, so the, the, uh, the how much snow did we have all together in the last uh, three days. And this is a very relevant variable, and if we look at only, only at this variable. And then, of course, the hazard level increases the more snow we had in the last uh, three days. And if uh, the snowpack uh, of the last uh, three days is more than one meter, then it's extremely dangerous. Huh? But what happens in between? I mean, if it's less than 20 centimeters, it's harmless, but in between, we, I mean, these are the data points in between. Huh? And now, look, I mean, this is a comparison of eager and lazy learning. If we would do a linear approximation of our data, so we would use our data points and then fit a straight line. We would get something like that, which would not represent our data perfectly. But if we do lazy learning, we always look at the nearest neighbors and then we would get something like that, which is much better. Huh? So you see the lazy learning method gives us a local approximation. And if we do such a local linear approximation, we are much better than using a global linear approximation. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's kind of a trade-off. 
The global linear approximation has the advantage that I compute the formula for my straight line from my training data. Suppose I have a million data points, then it takes some computational effort to compute this line. But once I have this line, it's easy. I mean, it, then it's, it's a nanosecond or whatever to, yeah, it's extremely short computational time to, uh, to compute the hazard level for some new input value. Whereas for the lazy learning, if I have a million uh, data points, it would be a lot of effort to, to classify a new, a new data point. And therefore, in many applications, we prefer the eager learning methods. But then, of course, we would not be satisfied with the linear approximation. Then we would need a more sophisticated approximation um, function, not just a linear function. And then the problems arise. Then we have the problems, what function class should we use for approximating our data points? Huh? And that's what we will, we will talk about this issue in depth in, in the math lecture uh, during the, yeah, towards the end of this semester. There we will go into function approximation and we will see that it's not easy at all. Huh? I mean, this is a big field of mathematics. Um, yeah, I don't go into this deeper now. For the moment, you have the alternatives. Uh, use the nearest neighbor method or use a perceptron. Huh? Okay. Yeah. And now, uh, yeah, I talk about case-based reasoning. Um, because, in some sense, case-based reasoning is very similar to the nearest neighbor method. Case-based reasoning is an area which was very popular in AI during the last 30 years. And that's why I want to mention it. Um, yeah, it's basically an extension of the nearest neighbor method to data which are not numeric, to symbolic data. Let's look at an example. So we want to have an, um, an adaptive expert system for diagnosis of bicycle defects. Huh? And we do something like the nearest neighbor method. We just store in a database all the cases of broken bicycles I have seen. And now there is this new bicycle, or not new, there is this broken bicycle that I have, and then I look in my database which ones were the most similar. Huh? And then I look, oh, what did I do at that time and I will do this now. That's the idea. Okay. So now we, we, we do have the case base, which is the database. Yeah? And then there is the query. And these are my variables or features. So the defective part is the real line. The bicycle model is this one. And the year, power source, bulb condition. So the light bulb, it's okay light cable condition, I don't know. And then the diagnosis. That's actually what I want to know. I want to know what was the, uh, what was the, the reason for my defect. And also I want to know how can I repair this defect. Now in my database, I find a case where it is not the real light which is broken, but it's the front light. And this is the type of bicycle, that's the year. Power source is not a battery, it's a dynamo. Uh, bulb is okay, cable is okay, was okay. And the diagnosis was the front electrical contact was missing. 
and the repair was established front electrical contact. Okay? Yeah, so now the question is what should we do here? Maybe we should look whether the rear electrical contact is missing and if so then we would establish the rear electrical contact but you never know yeah I mean that's what we can read here the transformation the question is how should I transform my case from the case space to my new case? Uh, that's the question. Th this is one question. The second question is, I mean this is my vector of my feature vector of the new case and this is the feature vector of the old case. How can I here with these symbolic descriptions compute the distance in order to find the nearest neighbor. For example, look here. Would it make much sense to say, okay, mm, the number of characters that are not equal from this uh, model name and this model name, does that make sense? No, I don't think so. So the question is, what, what about similarity between bicycle models? That's the problem in case-based reasoning. Now let's, let's look at, the, at the, the CBR schema. So what we want is, so we do have our database of all these old cases which we have stored. And now there comes this query X, this new case. And I want to know, that's what I want. I want to come from my query to a solution for this new case. But now what I do is, I look in my database for, for a matching case, for a case which is most similar to our query, most similar or which is the nearest neighbor. Huh? So I look for the nearest neighbor in the database. Suppose this would be possible or easy. Now I found this case. But this is not yet the solution for my case X. Yeah, I want to have a solution for my case X. Okay, but there is in the database a solution for this old case Y. And now the question is, how do I come from the solution for this old case to a solution for the new case X? And that's, that's the, the critical, crucial question in CBR. Yeah, here you can read reverse transformation. Okay, yeah, that sounds easy because it's just the reverse of this transformation. But this is not easy at all. If we do nearest neighbor, okay, then we know these two guys, they are close to each other. But that's all we know. But the question is, how do I transform this case into this one? No idea. I mean, look back to our example. What is the transformation from this case to that case? Yeah, maybe, maybe here it's obvious. We, we might transform rear into front because the rest here is the same. But should we do some transformation here or there? And here, how to transform a battery into a dynamo? So this is not obvious at all, how to transform such a case into another case. Now if this is not trivial, 
then we do not have this transformation and therefore we, uh, we have no idea about the reverse transformation and therefore we have no idea how to transform the solution of the case from the case space into a solution for our query X. I mean it's a nice diagram, it's a nice idea and too many, way too many AI researchers have published thousands or tens of thousands of papers about this nice idea but with no results. Yeah. That's, I mean, I always was amazed when I read about conferences about case-based reasoning. Yeah? And, I mean, this was not, uh, not really successful, but for, for 30 years there were conferences and meetings and millions of euros and dollars spent for uh, researchers traveling around the globe, but with no results. I mean, this was immediately uh, obvious that it's impossible. It's virtually impossible for, for non-trivial domains. I mean, there are trivial examples where it works, but they are just toy examples. But of course it has to be mentioned because for a long time it was a, uh, it was a big area of AI. Okay, I talked about these problems already. Yeah, okay. And that's it with um, the nearest neighbor method. Are there any uh, questions remaining about nearest neighbor? Okay, so then we go into the next section which is decision tree learning and um, Decision tree learning still is not very popular. Oh, may, may I ask you, who has already heard about decision tree learning? Who has heard about neural networks? Okay, yeah, neural networks are very popular, but you've never heard about decision tree learning. And this is, I mean, I don't know what's the real reason. Maybe it's historic. Maybe it's because neural networks remind us of what's in here, in our brain, and maybe decision trees uh, are not in our brain. Uh, I don't know what's the reason for that. But actually decision trees are much more important and much more powerful for modern AI than uh, neural networks are. And you will see it. You will see the advantages of decision trees. Um, and decision trees are something very simple. This is one of the reasons why they are so successful. Okay, I mean, I hope you have already heard what a decision tree is. If not, it's no problem either because they are so simple. So this, is, this here is a decision tree for a situation how it hopefully may happen within a month from now when it's winter. Yeah? Uh, so then um, we may want to know whether it's worth going into the Alps for skiing or not. Yeah? And this is a decision tree for the decision about skiing or not. Yeah? First, I need to know the snow distance. So what is the closest spot in the Alps from here where we have good snow conditions? Yeah? So if the distance to, the, to good snow conditions is less than or equal to 100 kilometers, then we decide to go skiing. If it's uh, bigger than 100, yeah, then it depends on whether we have time and on the, during the weekend, uh, maybe even then we might go uh, skiing. But uh, now if it's a weekend, then maybe we want to have uh, sunny weather. So if it's a weekend and the sun is shining, uh, then we go skiing. If it's a weekend and no sun, no skiing or if it's not a weekend, then no skiing. That's quite easy. 
So now the point is that we want now to automatically generate such a decision tree from our training data. And maybe you already see one of the really big advantages of decision tree learning. Because if from your training data you can automatically produce such a decision tree, then every human, every human being is able to understand the knowledge that you extracted from your data which was not possible for the Perceptron and even more it was impossible for the uh, nearest neighbor method. But here you get a really nice symbolic representation of the knowledge inside your data. And uh, so what we now uh, are going to develop is an algorithm uh, that extracts such a decision tree from our training data. Uh, and um, yeah, first we have to define the variables. So we have the variables key, sun, snow, dist, and weekend, which are binary variables. All, all of them are binary vari variables. This one is the distance uh, less than 100 or uh, greater than 100. Yeah, and then here we have the training data. This is just a tabular of the training data on day number one with this snow distance, weekend, sun, we went skiing, and so on. So we have 11 such training data vectors. And um, yeah, so now, yeah, the question is how does the tree come from the data? Given these data, how can I find such a tree? Let's look at the data again. No? I mean, basically, yeah, and maybe, yeah, oh, we should stop, but we just develop a, li uh, a little tree from the data. We start with, uh, on the root, we just take one of our variables. Let's take, uh, no, let's start with skiing. as the first variable. Oh no, sorry, ski skiing is our class variable. That's not, that's not a good idea. Yeah. We don't use this. We use uh, sun. Yes? No. So now in for sun equal yes, we take the days number one, two, and which others? Four, five, six, seven. And nine, ten. These are the days where we have sun equal yes. And now we take as a next variable snow dist, for example. And we, we take the decision again. So we just, you see, we let our data points fall down here. And now a part of these data goes here and another part goes here and we get a next variable which is weekend yes no and finally here we have the decision uh, so this is for skiing yes no um, Weak and yes, no. Yeah, sorry. So we, we should use for weak and yes, no. And now in this, now down here, let's see. For sun, yes, snow, dist, 
less than 100 snow uh, sun yes snow disk less than or equal to 100 which are these cases you see uh, and what is weak and yes so we have these three cases they are left yeah. and in these three cases the answer is skiing yes so then here yes weak and yes the answer would be yes and now lo let's look here for weak and no sun yes sun yes and weak and no among these four um, we get only this one which is yes too huh? so we get an answer of yes too and now you see how we could produce the whole tree that's quite easy it's very easy we just let our data flow down the whole tree and then down here we do a maturity decision that's it huh? that's very easy it's as easy as it can be but there is only one little disadvantage if we do it in this naive way we may get quite large trees huh? because we have to expand the whole tree fully so we have to expand all branches down to the bottom of the tree and if we have many variables suppose we have 10 binary variables then the number of leaf nodes would be 1024 so it would be quite a big tree yeah? and what we see next time is a method that um, prunes our trees so we get really quite small trees uh, even if we have a large number of variables and uh, I mean having small trees is desirable for two reasons reason number one is small trees are easy to understand for us humans reason number two big trees tend to overfit our data huh? so they do not generalize very well but we'll look at this tomorrow morning thank you